Um, so I would like to talk about, first to start in talking about um, um, the way how we approach um, new treatments or how we approach bring new treatments into, into patients. I think this is a very, very important issue and I think it's uh, also something that still needs to be improved over time in the next couple of years. And, um, and then I will go over and give you some of, uh, also some preliminary data about the tolerization mechanism uh, that we are currently working on. So, from a view of a clinician, I think we really can say that we live in a golden era of um, MS treatment, so there's no year passing by where we don't have any new treatment uh, that we can give to our patient. And as this, this you can see, this is just a shows the number of publications on phase three clinical trials. And this is something that I think is remarkable um, for MS, because if you look at the overall drug development, this is something that is very much outstanding. Overall, we know that the efficiency of developing new drugs for a certain disease really declined from year to year and, uh, and has now really halved every, every nine years. So if you think about the number of drugs approved per billion of US dollars that you have to spend on these drugs. So this is something that the pharma company have to, have to deal with. And, and what, but what we, of course, also as a clinician or academ academic people working on you know, new drugs and development, this is something that always scares us. So we, we know that the time uh, that you have to invest um, to get um, a new substance, not only um, to, to have it GMP manufacturers and to be able to use it, but then also to bring it into the patient, uh, it takes a lot of time. And, and then I think this is the phase where uh, we really have to find very uh, intelligent ways um, how to bring this to patients to really show that it's meaningful to pursue this further. I think MS was so successful in recent years, also because not all the drugs went through that. We know that many of the drugs were more or less repositioned, so were not explicitly um, developed for the treatment of multiple sclerosis. If you think through what was really thought from the beginning as being a new treatment uh, developed for MS, then we can see that this is the Copaxone that was really developed only for the treatment of MS and also um, um, Tysabri that was initially uh, developed uh, for treating multiple sclerosis. Most of the drugs uh, were uh, some way of repurposed uh, for MS, or at least the therapeutic approaches were repurposed, and I think this was done very efficiently, and I think this is also an intelligent way uh, to come to new therapies. But nevertheless, um, we also see that the efficiency of drug development does not really go down because the first part is, is the problem, and, and it shows you that even with the new technologies that have appeared over the last couple of years, where we can really, with a high throughput uh, way, uh, screen new drugs, test new drugs uh, in a preclinical way, I think the real, real, real bottleneck and the, and, and the real problem is here when we really go from a preclinical to an early phase, phase one, or more importantly, a phase two clinical trial. Here, nine out of 10 drugs fail, and the thing is not always that it's the wrong drug that has been used or it's the, it's the wrong uh, way one has developed the drug, but it's really often also the wrong trial design and, and the wrong time point to, to take it into the patient. I think this is something that also the authors of this uh, paper concluded that uh, the, the real, to find a good clinical uh, trial uh, in an early phase, uh, also in patients with MS, is, is something that is really, really important and something that I think we also are not there yet and have to go uh, through that together in the next uh, couple of days. So we really have to uh, find something that is as homogeneous, so patient selection, I think, is very important. Um, having good centers, having uh, the possibility to not look only at clinical data, but to add also biomarker data and other information um, um, to really find and find a proof of mechanism and beside them a proof of concept. So I think it's important to really um, get as much as possible information out of our early phase clinical trial. This is the way we approach it. So we really try not only to get the proof of concept, but also provide some proof of mechanism. This needs to include biomarkers, um, other clinical information uh, from these patients. Um, you need to have a good knowledge to know what you are looking for and also what you 
want to find in this patient to really um, underscore uh, the, the, the mechanism that you presume. And I think something that is very important is the uh, selection of patients uh, for early phase clinical trial to really uh, be as um, efficient as possible in finding uh, a proof of concept whether the treatment works and, and, and is meaningful to further pursue and the further development. I think a very good example for that is this um, uh, trial that was done by Roland Martin and his group at the, at the NIH, where they for the first time used this anti-CD25 uh, monoclonal antibody, Taclizumab, to treat patients with multiple sclerosis at that time. And on, by treating only 11 patients, they were able to show a good efficacy in the drug. They were able to show the mechanism of action that was also a newly um, um, a found mechanism of action of the drug, and finally this drug, as you know, is now um, on the market uh, as Simbrighter uh, since 2016. So this is more or less the way I think one can go and, and, and should go and, and when, it, when it really works well. But I think the problem is that um, we have certain challenges that we have to face if we go this way. Um, I think that the, um, the patient population, as you know, changed over time, so it's uh, we're really getting in, in trouble to find patients, to recruit patients, and to convince patients also to go into clinical trials with all the possibilities that we have at the moment. If, if you look here, these are only data from, from uh, Interferon Beta 1A, so the Rebif. And if you look at the annualized relapse rate in, this, in clinical trials and patients on treatment, you see that the same treatment over time lead to very different um, reductions and uh, and, and overall scores um, and values of, of the analyzed relapse rate. So meaning that the, the, the population change a lot, and uh, this is something that, of course, if you think what would be the outcome parameter that you would like to show, that it has enough sensitivity to show the change that you need. And it also means if we have less active patients and we have uh, the treatments that focus on reducing disease activity in this patient, that, of course, the group um, in certain instances has to get higher unless we find new and more intelligent ways to, 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 to um, uh, look at the, at the outcome parameters in early phase clinical trials. So this is, I think, one of the, of the challenges and the caveats that we have to see. Another is that, of course, with time and with, with being more efficient and more effective uh, with new drugs, we also have to change the outcome parameters on the clinical, but also on the surrogate uh, outcome parameters. As you can see here, this was uh, presented by and uh, published by Gavin, for example, uh, the data on, on using Lemtrada in patients with multiple sclerosis. And we come now to new outcomes. We want to new outcome parameters. We also want to measure improvement. This is something that is completely new in the field. And I think that the measures that we have at the moment uh, maybe sometimes not the best one to really be able to show improvement in patients, although we want to measure this in the future. So I think here would be meaningful to use the new possibilities that we get from digital medicine, from mobile health application. We have started to work on that. There were two students from the uh, Bern uh, University of Applied Science that together with us um, had the aim to develop a comprehensive tool to evaluate MS patients using app-based methods to really go to look for the impairment of hand and arm, cognition, fatigue, depression, quality of life, and gait, and to then be able to have a continuous uh, monitoring of patients and really look what is the impact of a new treatment in the daily life and in the daily environment of our patient. I think this is something that at least holds the promise to, to also enrich future uh, clinical trials. And I think we should put all the efforts uh, together uh, to come to, the, to that for our MS patients. And another important point and another challenge that I, I told you is the recruitment of patients. I think here's, I'm very happy and it is, I think we have a very good situation in, in Switzerland. Um, we have uh, a new trial that we are going to approach with a new trial design the, on, on a substance. This is a polyphenol coming from, from olive, olive uh, leaves, and, and, and to a lesser extent, the fruits. And um, we want to use this as a neuroprotective um, agent in MS. This is done by the group in, 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 in Zurich. Um, uh, for, uh, Sven Schipling uh, is using this OCT outcome parameter to show whether there's a neuroprotective effect, and it's, I think, a very 
good and, and, and I hope that we will get the funding for this trial because this is um, a trial that is really now um, a collaborative action between several groups in Switzerland. And I think this is the way we should go. So we should really join our forces in Switzerland. I think this is an, a very good opportunity here um, to, to work together uh, between the different centers with all the expertise that we have in the different centers and to really bring new treatments faster and more efficiently to patients in the future. The effectiveness of treatment is increasing, this um, you all know. Um, I will not talk about uh, autologous hepatopoietic stem cell transplantation. This is something that we will discuss uh, later in this morning and also in the afternoon. But I, I think what this slide shows, that shows the, the, the proportion of patients that are, have no evident disease activity at two years, um, we see that first we we can get an improvement over time, and this is, I think, an important improvement, but it's, it also shows us that there is room, there is space uh, to even do better, um, not only in terms of efficacy, but also in terms of reducing toxicity, reducing side effects and risk for patients. And therefore, we still have several unmet medical needs, and it's just to say that I think it still is important, although we have a lot of possibilities, it still is important to improve, and I think that also what Gavin showed now, that um, we really have the possibility of going with new concepts and, and, and with new ideas uh, to bring new treatments to the patient and, and, and make life better for them. The major unmet medical needs that we have, and we are approaching some of that, is of, as I told you, efficacy, good balance between efficacy and safety of new drugs. I think when, when we are trying over the last couple of years to really go to the, to the, let's say, the root of the disease and try to find out whether this is an antigen-specific disease and whether we, if we intervene in an antigen-specific way we can treat the disease. I think this holds still the promise that if by re-establishing immune tolerance we can um, um, at least reduce the uh, um, disease activity in this patient. Neuroprotection is something that I just showed you we are approaching and several groups are working on that and remarination, as you know, there's a, a, phase, two, uh, a phase two clinical trial that has just started with a new compound, uh, opicinumab, to um, uh, go for remarination in this patient. So, so I think there's a lot of going on um, um, in the field. The approaches that we in, in Zurich as a group uh, we are currently uh, following, and these are all the approaches where we are already in humans, where we went already in patients, so we went a step from, from, being the, um, from the, uh, identifying a substance, going through the, all the regulatory process, GMP manufacturing, and go to bring this into the patients. We have one approach using NSL, also saline-based nanoparticles for immunomodulation in this patient, the high those immunosuppression and autologous stem cell transplantation is something that will be discussed also later. Um, and I want to point you towards one approach that we are currently following and we're just going into phase of one clinical trial that is a cell-based approach to use antigen-specific immune tolerance. And this is something interesting that um, I think also has happened uh, in the field over the last couple of years so that a cell type that maybe we were not so interested in in, in the last years popped up a little bit as being a potently uh, good carrier cell, at least, to um, bring information on target antigens into the body and then um, bring the body to uh, um, induce or recreate an immune tolerance phenotype in this patient. And this is the, the, the red blood cell. So, as always, if you think that something is very new in medicine, you just go to the literature and you find out that it's not new at all. And it's, as you can see here, already uh, nearly 60, more than 60 years ago, that it was already described that if you, if you couple an antigen to the, to the surface of erythrocytes in mice, and this was an, an up, shown for an haptin, you can really um, induce tolerance um, towards this antigen in, the, in these mice although at that time point it was not really understood how it works. And there was another group that was uh, from Schuf that already had started a, a couple of years ago also to couple uh, antigens to the surface of erythrocytes using a peptide linker. And here, for example, in an animal model of uh, type 1 diabetes, they showed that uh, they can, could, were able to not only induce uh, antigen-specific immune tolerance, but also to treat the disease um, in these in this mice. 
And there are several other approaches that also focus on using erythrocytes as carrier cells to induce antigen-specific uh, immune tolerance in patients. So, for example, here a covalently linked antigen peptides to the surface of the cell, and here a company that, uh, that goes for a new expression of new antigen on uh, the surface of red blood cells. We also, uh, already in parallel with, uh, with this group, had started uh, to focus on these type of cells. We uh, have an, developed now an approach where we couple myelin peptides to the surface of the cell, and you can see that they are completely covered with these peptides in an autologous way, and then the idea would be to inject these into, into patient and um, induce antigen-specific tolerance, and I will later show you that we we'll make a lot of effort to really show this proof of mechanism in our patient. But what is the um, mechanism that is involved there? This is not completely understood at the moment. Um, we know that the, that the principle, so using cells and coupling the antigens to the surface of the cell is very efficient in inducing antigen-specific immune tolerance, not only in an autoimmune disease model, as you can see here in several autoimmune disease models, but also in models of allergy and even uh, transplantation. So this has been shown for splenocytes, but also for uh, red blood cells uh, previously. And we approached this already a few years ago. We did a phase one clinical trial where we took uh, white blood cells at that time from patients with multiple sclerosis and covered these white blood cells with uh, seven myelin peptide and in injected them IV into this patient. And uh, the most important uh, part of the first demand study was that it was excellently tolerated. There were no any safety concerns. And in some of these patients and those treated with a higher doses, uh, we were also able to show that this immune responses that we measure before the treatment in these patients, and these are these red dots, these uh, T-cell reactivities in these patients, at least um, are not increased as the most important part of a phase one clinical trial, and there were also patients where we can see that there's a reduction in these um, um, antigen-specific uh, responses. So at least it's a, some very preliminary, I must say, but uh, some proof of mechanism that this, uh, this could work. But what happens with erythrocytes when we couple peptides to the surface of erythrocytes? So what we know is that uh, they change, they increase in their size, and what you can see here is that they get in, an increase in intracellular calcium, and they get expression of annexin 5 on the surface of the cell in the short term, but even more in the long term. And this means that these cells undergo what we call a programmed cell death. This is not only known for nucleated cells, but also known for um, uh, erythrocytes, that's called eryptosis. So this is something that is a non-immunogenic um, um, cell, cell death of these erythrocytes, and this should then bring the information um, to um, phagocytes. But how does this work? So what we know, if, if we inject these cells into mice, if we couple them with this fluorophore and then we inject the cells into mice, what we see is that, they, they, that they, there's a, a, a short... I mean, in the short term, this is a dose-dependent study here. You can see that um, they are recruited very fastly and very efficiently, mainly to the liver. This is also something that was uh, interesting for us to see and new for us to see. And if we look at histological uh, slides, for example, we can see that um, macrophages in the liver, more likely kupfer cells in the sinus, sinusoids of the liver, um, phagocytose, this erythrocyte, and you can find them within the cell body. So it seems that these cells, they don't survive very long in the body. They really, after, shortly after being injected, they are recruited to the spleen, also to the liver, and are taken up there by, by macrophages. And we know that both of these uh, organs are important. Every day, um, they, are, they are fluted with hundreds of different uh, antigens, and it is a very important function of both the, the liver and the spleen to, to prevent um, immune activation and uh, autoimmunity every day to, towards these different kinds of antigens. We think that this is one of the mechanisms, an important mechanism of action of this treatment, and there's also the reason why in the animal model this really leads to a long-term effect. So, and in some of the models you really cannot induce the disease anymore after uh, these mice have been treated. So we are currently in a phase 1b clinical study in a dose escalation study in this patient. And when you, what you can see is uh, that we put a lot of effort not only on the clinical side to really uh, show that the, that the treatment is safe and it is well tolerated, but we also are very much interested 
and do a lot of biosampling and, and, and immunological analysis to really show this proof of mechanism or to be able to show the proof of mechanism that we induce something that is antigen specific and, and we can down regulate immune responses towards um, myelin peptides. So the trial is still open. If any one of you has patients that are interested in, in joining such a clinical trial, you can always uh, contact me or you can go to our homepage where we always announce the different clinical trials that we, that we do and then you can, you can, from there you can get uh, always in contact with us and we are happy then to answer all your questions on the, on the different trials. So I would like to conclude to uh, thank the whole group in, in, in Zurich that uh, works on that, the collaboration with the WIS Zurich and also the funding from the WIS Zurich for the clinical trials, uh, the group in Milan that helped with the, with the mice experiments and the hematology uh, department at, at USZ. Of course, the funding agency and I have also to disclose that I'm a co-founder from a company uh, called Celeris that maybe in future if this if this works out, um, could help to bring this to patients. Thank you very much.